Good evening and welcome to The Frame, an initiative of Access Framingham. My name is Brendan Fitzpatrick. We start tonight with budget season news as the City Council voted to approve the fiscal year 2025 operating budget during their meeting on Tuesday, June 4th at the Memorial Building. The grand total of that budget, $358.8 million, which is close to a $15 million raise or 4.4% compared to the FY24 budget. The new budget features $5.3 million projected in new revenue due to a 2.5% tax levy raise. Final approval came after the Finance Subcommittee recommended removing $200,000 from the city's budgeted reserve fund on May 21st. To compensate, District 2 City Councilor Brandon Ward made a motion to bring the transfer from Framingham's free cash fund down to $3.3 million. That motion passed, as did the final amended budget. One of the three city councilors who voted against the FY25 budget on Tuesday was District 4's Michael Cannon, who had previously asked officials to find parts that may not be quote-unquote mission critical for the upcoming year. Now he's calling for members of the budget process going forward to think of new ways to efficiently find a budget that works for the whole city while being mindful of outside factors like inflation and state aid. And I can get behind, as we all have, and as the community has, in digging deep and spending more and sacrificing more for something that's transformative, innovative, a new school, as our community has supported in the past. But just a massive spending increase and a really big tax increase in, at a time when it is least affordable. Dana was joined by at-large City Councilor George King and Christine Long of District 1 in voting against the proposed FY25 budget. The review of the Framingham Home Rule Charter rolled on last Thursday as the Charter Review Committee is finalizing their recommendations to pass along to the City Council. Notable recommended changes have aimed to feature more legislative and financial transparency, additional public comment opportunities on the City's budget creation process, and more efficiency for capital budget planning. In recent weeks, public feedback has been solicited by the committee, who's taking insights and thoughts from residents into account during their final review. Among the recent tweaks suggested during Thursday's meeting at the Memorial Building, the addition of spots within the state and federal governments to the list of positions that elected Framingham officials would be barred from holding while in office at the municipal level. Anna Blummer is the chair of the Charter Review Committee. I think it was just a question of if the idea is that people should focus, these elected positions are important and they should focus on one and give other people a chance to do it, that same logic can hold true to state positions. Other propositions brought up on Thursday included an expansion to the amount of time that the City Council or School Committee would be able to act on an initiative before it's considered accepted. That time frame would be 60 days if approved, as well as having a special election triggered for a vacant School Committee or district-specific City Council seat if it becomes available within the first 15 months of a term, compared to the prior suggestion of 18 months. The group's recommendations also clarified that the city's mayor would have to hold a public budget hearing before the annual budget is submitted to city councilors. The Charter Review Committee's final report and proposals are due to the city council by the end of the month. Eversource held a commissioning event at the Framingham Public Schools Administration Complex on Tuesday to mark the completion of their geothermal energy neighborhood project, a first of its kind across the U.S., according to the utility company. The pilot program will offer clean energy through temperatures under the Earth's surface. Liquids, wells, pumps and pipes will be utilized to take advantage of the consistent temperature below the surface of around 55 degrees. The geothermal system will pull heat up from the ground and into buildings during the winter while pumping heat out of buildings and into the ground in the summer. Joe Nolan is the chairman, president and CEO of Eversource. This is going to be the start of great things not just here in Massachusetts, but you'll see it across the country. Uh, just know that you folks are trailblazers here in Framingham and that we are proud to partner with you. 31 residential and five commercial buildings on roads such as Concord Street and Prindeville Ave are now set to be served through Eversource's new geothermal system, which had its groundbreaking ceremony last June by the Farley Building. The program was created as a way to help meet decarbonization goals set by state officials. Eversource says their pilot program can provide eco-friendly energy in a sustainable, efficient, and affordable manner to homes and businesses alike. Framingham Mayor Charlie Sasitsky also thanked Eversource for their assistance on renovations to the Concord Street Fire Station and the Farley Building through this plan. 
This energy project will not only benefit the residents and business owners in this neighborhood, but the city as a whole. Conversions will be completed throughout the summer, as Eversource will be set to begin collecting data from their pilot program next month. From there, the company explained that they will be studying figures from two heating and cooling seasons to determine if the geothermal system is viable from a cost and environmental perspective. Eversource anticipates monthly energy costs for participants will drop by around 15 to 20 percent on average. Updates regarding the cleanup process at the former General Chemical site on Leland Street were provided by state officials at Harmony Grove Elementary School Tuesday night. After decades of use as a storage facility for things like petroleum and other hazardous materials, the site has been dormant since 2012 when General Chem ceased operations there. While it was used, harmful chemicals, some of which have been recognized as probable carcinogens by the EPA, seeped into the site's groundwater and soil. That caused residents to move, homes to be knocked down, and for that area to be abandoned. Officials with the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection told residents on Tuesday that thousands of pounds of chlorinated solvents have been removed from the property in recent years, thanks to thermal treatment, which essentially vaporizes chemicals that pose a hazard. The next major step in the process is the demolition of a warehouse that the state believes is a major contamination source. That's set to begin in late June or July, according to state officials, and it should take four to six weeks to finish. More research into the soil and groundwater by the warehouse will then follow in order to determine its contamination footprint. State officials are planning on additional thermal treatment work to take place next spring or summer. As this summer continues, you can be sure that we'll be keeping you updated with the news that matters to your community. More details on the developments you've seen tonight and additional stories across the city can be found on the newest source for local information, www.theframe.news. Articles written there provide more details on these stories, while you can watch feature pieces we've recently developed as well. Be sure to subscribe to our email newsletter to have all the latest stories from The Frame delivered straight to your inbox. Also, a reminder that we're always looking for more story ideas from you and your neighbors. Whether it's updates on any municipal matters, details on a local event, or anything in between, you're more than welcome to reach out to us and tell us more. You can reach us by phone or by email. Dial 508-216-0003 and leave a voicemail message for us. Or send an email to the frame at accessframe.tv. We'd love to hear more from you. We're going to step aside for just a moment, but when we return with the 2024 Framingham Farmers Market season just a few weeks away, we spoke with some of the farmers who provide their products to local consumers as we learned more about the challenges they face and the dedication that they have to their work. Stick around. The Frame will be back after this. Have you ever helped a fellow veteran? Of course. Yes. Have you ever asked for help yourself? Uh -huh. It's always tough, right? I always feel like I can solve my own problems, but eventually, you know, you just can't deal with it on your own. And you start to question, maybe people would be better off without me. When you realize that you're not alone, once you take that first step, there's so much support. Welcome back in as it's now time for our weekly focus. The Framingham Farmers Market will soon return with its first day of the season set for Thursday, June 20th. In addition to various vendors and organizations being present, the Frame wanted to check in on some of the farms that will be setting up weekly along the Center Common. Our own Mackenzie Wright joins us now to share more. Mackenzie? Brendan, I caught up with two farms in particular who will be providing fresh produce all season long at Framingham's Farmers Market. Kelly's Farm, which is located in Upton, Massachusetts, is returning this year, and Heaven's Harvest Farm will be making the trek from New Braintree. Both of these farms' managers stress the importance of supporting local farmers, especially following a grueling 2023 growing season, which saw devastating flooding, frost, and a deep freeze. We think it's really important to treat the, the soil well, to treat the land well, and to 
be as natural as we can. Here at Heaven's Harvest Farm, a USDA certified organic farm with about 100 different variations of produce, high quality and natural goods are top of mind for farm manager Joshua Howard and his dedicated team. We are not allowed to, nor do we want to use any chemicalized or synthetic fertilizers pesticides, insecticides. It's really important that we address the fertility of the soil. That is a, a primary objective in organic farming so that that plant can establish itself and of its own accord defend itself against pests and insects and disease. We just believe that the chemicalized insecticides, pesticides, fertilizers, they're not good for your health. And we know that the body cannot process chemicals well at all and it's not as simple as just washing them off. Not only is growing organic a way of life here at Heaven's Harvest, it's rooted in the farm's very foundation. Josh's father, Ashley, and his wife founded Heaven's Harvest Farm in 1994. After navigating some very difficult health challenges, Ashley experienced firsthand the positive impact 100% natural food and produce can have on one's well-being. Ashley told me that Heaven's Harvest had humble beginnings. The land had been untouched for a few years before he purchased it. He joked that he made just about every mistake under the sun as he built the farm from the ground up, using his salary as a teacher. Now with the help of his son Josh, Heaven's Harvest is thriving in its endeavors to create natural foods, which they sell to over 18 different Whole Foods locations, seven farmers markets including Framingham's, and more. We've been spot tested by the USDA at our markets where they come unannounced, take whatever they want off that table, and they take it back to a lab and test it. Our uh, cherry tomatoes, last time they were tested, were free of 275 chemical compounds that they test for. So not a single trace of any one of those compounds. Some people might say that all organic food is overcharged. I totally disagree. I can show you our books and what those look like. Yeah, the profit margins are negligible if, if any. It is more expensive. Um, the labor often is more intensive. Um, the things that we use to benefit the soil and to build up its structure and, um, is more expensive just buying seeds alone organic seed is always more expensive. At a time when the cost of everything is up, inflation can be uniquely challenging for farmers. That's according to Rick Kelly of Kelly's Farms in Upton, Massachusetts, who spoke with me over the phone. But nothing tops Mother Nature. The rain, the, the wet, last year was very, very bad. I think every farm had trouble last year. I really don't know any farm that, that didn't. And inflation as well. With, with the bad weather, that means we have to buy more things. We have to import more produce. We have to buy more stuff to sell, which costs. And, and last year, not only inflation, but all the farmers being in the same boat with the bad weather, that, made, that drove up prices as well, too. Kelly's farm has been in business since 1936 and started out as a couple of tables on the side of the road. Rick Kelly, who manages the farm along with his father and uncle, takes pride in their old-fashioned and nostalgic stand here on Milford Street. While they're no stranger to the ways in which weather can impact their crops, last year was different. When it's too wet, there's not much you can do but just kind of, you know, watch things rot, I guess. Kelly's farm was just one of hundreds of farms across Massachusetts that received funding from the state government last year through the Natural Disaster Recovery Program. Between a deep freeze in February of 2023 to an early frost in May and then disastrous flooding in July, it was a devastating year for many farmers. I read the list of farmers and I, I just about every farmer I know got help last year. Mm -hmm. So it was that was the first year we ever really had to do that. Heaven's Harvest was also included on that list. On a random Sunday afternoon, Josh received a phone call from Massachusetts Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll. At first, he thought it was a prank, but sure enough, a few hours later, he got a follow-up call from Governor Maura Healy. We had a good conversation. She said that they were gonna work really hard to help the farmers, and they did. They came through, and they did a, a good job, and so we're really grateful for that. And that was an excellent example of what kind of effort it takes for for a community to support its food structure. To see the community, you know, invest into local food by paying, you know, what's necessary for that food to be grown. I know no farmer that's getting rich. One of the things I tell anybody that comes to work here is that nobody farms to make money, they farm because they love it. The point is to grow great quality food 
on behalf of the people that want to eat it. We, we can't survive without the customer support, basically. It's hard to compete with the grocery store prices, you know what I mean? There's, they sell a lot more volumes than we do. So, Growing your own stuff, though, I think um, people don't mind paying a little extra if it, the quality is, is unsurpassable. You know, if you have to make the extra trip to, uh, to the farmer's market or to our store or other stores like ours, we really appreciate it. That's, this is what, that's what keeps us alive, you know, and the understanding of how important farms are to the community. It's very moving to see and hear the passion that these farmers have for their craft. And Josh even mentioned to me that he sees food as much more than just food. Rather, it's a center for gathering and interacting, like when you break bread together and share a meal. Josh said that their actual growing process is no different. It's about nurturing unity and strong relationships along with their goods. And that continues right along to the farmer's market, where people from all over the community gather together. Brendan? Okay, thank you for that, Mackenzie. Now again, if you want to support both Heaven's Harvest and Kelly's Farm, along with other local farmers in our area, you can come out to the Framingham Farmers Market starting Thursday, June 20th. Events will be held each week on the Center Common through October 10th. If you're heading over to the Framingham Farmers Market at any point this summer, you're welcome to share your experience with us on social media. You can find us on Instagram and X. Our handle for both of those sites is at framenews underscore Follow us for updates that are important to your community. Subscribe to the Access Framingham YouTube channel too, and hit the bell icon to ensure that you never miss an episode of The Frame when it's upload, uploaded every week. We're on Facebook as well. Find us there just by searching for The Frame. Before we take a short break now, we'd like to remind you that The Frame is an initiative of Access Framingham, your local community media center located on Vernon Street. AFTV's mission is to engage, serve, and enrich the community by creating media that's by and for the people of the city. Membership is open to anyone who lives, works, or studies in Framingham. AFTV's team was recently at the Callahan Center for the Senior Heroes Award ceremony that recognized four residents for their work within multiple facets of the community, two of which we spoke with for the frame. Let's take a look at some of the ceremony's highlights. I am so honored to be nominated. I, God put me in the right place when he chose nursing for me. It, I was a career of over 60 years. I still have my license and I will have it until I die. Um, I loved nursing and as an emergency room nurse, you needed to be able to accept anybody. Diversity, socioeconomic, anything. And welcome back. Let's see what else is happening in Framingham as residents gathered alongside local leaders Wednesday morning at the Callahan Club, just steps away from the city's main entrance to Callahan State Park. The event featured representatives from Mass Parks for All, a statewide nonprofit organization which aims to renew, expand, and connect public parks to communities alongside the Department of Conservation and Recreation and the Friends of Callahan State Park, or FOC for short. The groups teamed up to announce a new grassroots stewardship campaign for the nearly 1,000 acre park. According to FOC board chair Doug Lawrence, Friends of Callahan is an outgrowth of the 20 year old Callahan Dog Owners Group organization, which voted last fall to expand beyond its focus of dog use throughout the park and generalize community support. Mayor Sasitsky was on hand to reiterate the city's commitment to supporting accessible outdoor space. He used Framingham's efforts to expand trails in the area as an example, such as the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, which the city secured land for last year. We're kind of in the forefront of working on open space and supporting open space. And the idea of creating Friends of Callahan just fits with that whole plan that we have for creating trails and public open spaces in Framingham. It's a no-brainer to get together with all the different groups that use Callahan. There's so many people that use it. It's such a tremendous resource. Friends of Callahan put out a call for volunteers to get involved, from helping keep invasive species at bay, to assisting with trail maintenance, litter collection, and much more. If you're interested, you can visit www.massparksforall.org. The Friends of Callahan State Park also has a website of their own, which is still being finalized, 
but it should be up and running soon at www.friendsofcallahan.org. Meanwhile, the annual Festa Junina celebration is taking place on Saturday, June 8th here in Framingham. Festa Junina is one of the biggest traditions of Brazilian culture. Brazilian June festivals commemorate many feast days during the month, along with the season solstice, as the Framingham celebration is set to feature traditional Brazilian music, dancing, food, and more offerings from members of the community. The festival will be taking place from 1 to 8 p.m. at St. Tarsicius Parish along Waverly Street. Expect traffic delays in the area as plenty of people are slated to be in attendance on Saturday. The Framingham Repair Cafe is back as residents are invited to First Parish this Sunday the 9th to have whatever broken things they need fixed free of charge. Clothing, lamps, jewelry, electronics, small appliances, bikes, toys, and just about everything in between can be brought over from 2 to 5 p.m. to be mended. Residents can bring new parts for their respective items to the repair cafe as well. And finally tonight, graduation season wraps up with Framingham High School's senior class of 2024 being honored on Friday, June 7th. The graduation ceremony will be taking place at Bowditch Field from 5.30 to 7.30 Friday night. We'd like to say congratulations to all members of the FHS senior class and all other local graduates on the completion of yet another school year. That's all for this week's Framingham News in Focus. For all the members of the Frame team, thank you for spending time with us tonight. I'm Brendan Fitzpatrick. We'll talk to you next week. Take care.